Hello, and welcome to Tuneful Talk. This is Louisa and Candace. This podcast is devoted to discussing topics relevant to both music educators and music therapists. For more resources and podcasts, please visit our website, tunefultalk.weebly.com. Hope you enjoy. This is going to be the first podcast in a series of podcasts about incorporating music from around the world within your either music classroom or music therapy session. So a little bit about why we're discussing this topic and what inspired us. So if you're new to the podcast, you might not have met us before, but Louisa and I uh, originally met in the same district teaching elementary general music. We are now currently uh, continuing our education. I'm a doctoral student at UNT for music ed. Mm -hmm. And And I'm a music therapy grad student at TWU. But we're still noticing a lot of ways that music therapy and music education can help inform each other. So this is a a topic that that really speaks both to the music therapy side and the music education side. Yeah, and this specific topic kind of started off because of a multicultural perspectives class that we're taking together. Yes, because actually there's a way that I can take, even though I'm a UNT student, I can take courses at TWU and vice versa. Mm -hmm. So I really want to take advantage of that that and learn more about the music therapy side of things because, like I said, there's so much crossover and so much ways that we can help each other if we we engage in discussion together, Mm -hmm. music therapists and music educators. Communication. Yes. It's a wonderful thing. It's a wonderful thing. <laughs> yes. And this is, this topic of using music from different cultures is just really uh, a timely topic right now because we're such a globalized world right now and we need to, to learn more about each other. Mm-hmm. Yeah. Um, and I'm sure many of us have often heard that music is a cultural language of some sorts. In our, in a book I've been reading, The Psych- Psychological Foundations of Musical Behavior by Radosi and Boyle, they say that music is a powerful symbol of cultural identity, especially because musical style tends to reflect a highly stable set of culturally transmitted shared behaviors. So when Louisa and I are talking about music as a cultural language, we're describing culture as a set a set of attitudes and values, goals and practices that are shared by a people in a particular place and time. Uh, in fact, one of my favorite quotes, I had it on the on the wall in my classroom. It's from George Jelinek. It says, "The history of a people is found in its song." And so I've just always loved that how music is a way of passing down history as well. Mhm. That oral tradition. Mm -hmm. So I think to understand the origin of a song, we need to understand its cultural origin as well. To understand the pieces. Meaning? Like its meaning? Yeah. Is we have to also understand where it came from, what was going on at that time. Uh, And that's one reason why I also think that it's important to teach a song in its original language that it was written for. I can remember a specific discussion with a group of my third graders where I taught them a piece in Spanish that was from Puerto Rico. And you might you might see this piece uh, mentioned again in a later podcast. But I taught it in Spanish and then I taught a translated version. A word of caution about translations. They can be really good and really bad. You just kind of have to look at it. If they still, if they rhyme, Usually that means that it's not a really true translation. It's not true to what the language is saying. Uh, But this one was a a pretty good translation. I just asked my students what they thought about singing it in Spanish and singing it in English. And a lot of my students uh, were not Spanish speakers. And they still said, the song is so much better in Spanish. It, It makes so much more sense. Which... I thought was really neat that they noticed that. They noticed that the word stress would fit and the rhythms would fit better in the original language 
than in a translated version. Yeah. So even your young students are going to are going to pick up on that. Mhm. So now we got to get to getting over the fear of teaching a song from another language yeah, or I, another culture. We come across this in discussions with with our peers and our colleagues about well I there's a there seems to be a fear sometimes of well I can't share music from another culture. I'm there's either a fear of I'm not well enough informed about the culture mm-hmm. or uh, it's not my own culture, so how could how in the world could I represent it? Yeah, but if we don't share um, or teach what we know about other cultures, or even within our own culture, then when will our kids be exposed to it? As for me, I'm not, uh, I know my last name is Lopez, but I don't speak Spanish. I'm trying to learn. Um, so learning these songs kind of helped me connect with my own culture. Um, and then I had a large population of bilingual students at the school I taught at. And it, I used it as a teaching moment for myself because the students were able to correct me and, and I was able to build that, um, that bond with my students. Um, and they felt like they were teaching me something whenever mm-hmm. I was able to ask. And I was brave enough to ask, am I saying this right? And checking in with them. Mm -hmm. And I think that's a big thing as well. Mm -hmm. So giving the um, credit, Mm -hmm. I guess. Yeah, giving credit where credit is due. Absolutely. Because there is this this pervasive fear of the term that you hear a lot now is cultural appropriation. Dun, dun, dun. (laughs) So yeah, Louisa, will you explain a little bit about what cultural appropriation is? Knowing that this is actually a very new term. The definition that I think we agree on, and it just... Just looking at different sources, yeah. Yeah, so it says, the act of taking or using things from a culture that is not your own, especially without showing that you understand or respect this culture. And I think the biggest part we need to focus on is the second half, especially without showing that you understand or respect this culture. If you don't understand or you don't, or if you're not respecting this culture, then that's when you kind of get into some gray area with the difference between cultural appropriation and with you trying to really appreciate another culture. Uh, you don't want to spread the wrong rumors or stories. Yes, or, or reinforce stereotypes. Yeah. Um, so how can we move away from cultural appropriation to cultural appreciation. So again, there's a lot of different perspectives about what is cultural appreciation, but um, in general, that means when someone is seeking to understand and learn about another culture in an effort to broaden their own perspective and connect with that culture. So like when Louisa was saying, Cultural appreciation is showing is without showing that you understand. Cultural appreciation is the opposite of showing you understand. You said it twice. Uh, So appropriation is not understanding. Oh, appreciation. Thank you, Louisa. Is understanding. No, it's 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 a little the tongue twister. It is. (laughs) Thank you for correcting me. Yes, we want to be very clear (laughs) on that. So. Yeah, just to continue this and thinking about why teach songs from other cultures. uh, I mean, there's so many reasons to me why. First of all, like we want to show our students and our, and for you, your clients, different perspectives Mm -hmm. or perhaps um, things from their own cultural backgrounds. Yeah. Like, I mean, like for me, even though I'm not a Spanish speaker, My parents and my grandparents spoke Spanish, so hearing some of these songs or even sharing them with my students, it helped me make that familial connection um, and a historical connection with my background. Mm -hmm. And then as far as our clients, we're going to come across clients from all around the world, uh, especially depending on what part of either Texas or the United States that we may be located. And I think us reaching out and trying to uh, understand and connect. Yeah, trying to understand or connect with our clients by singing a song in their language, I think could really help to build relationships Mm -hmm. with those clients. 
So, yeah. Yeah, so for me, the big takeaway and about thinking about this line between appropriation and appreciation of cultures is that we need to always make sure we're making our best effort to understand the cultures of others and the cultural background of the songs that we're presenting Mm -hmm. and represent the music as authentically as possible, knowing that there's going to be shortcomings and just being realistic with that. Yeah. Um, And just listening. Yeah. Just listening. Listening to others and their feedback Mm -hmm. and maybe not taking it so harshly if yes. they're if they do correct you cuz i mean like i said we make we make honest mistakes sometimes yes pronunciation um, mistakes and mm-hmm. sometimes you just can't perform things on authentic instruments and yeah and uh later on we're going to come across uh how s- there's many a lot of songs are either sung have different verses mm-hmm. dep- depending on what part of that country it comes from or it may it may even have different uh, translations. So just being open-minded to the fact that there might be another version than the one that you're singing or you're presenting. Yeah, because when, I mean, a lot of these come from so far back sometimes that the oral tradition, it just results in a bunch of variations. Mm -hmm. Yeah. So since this podcast is an introduction before we start discussing cultures, uh, from other places around the world, We wanted to take some time and share with you songs from our childhood and songs from our own heritage. So, Louisa, do you want to go first? I will be glad to. Uh, As I said earlier, my family speaks Spanish, but I don't speak Spanish. And it mostly comes because I say it's because my parents wanted to keep secrets from us, which is partially (laughs) partially Secret Um, conversation. Yes. It's okay. (laughs) I guess. <laughs> but um, my family has been here for a few generations. So I think that's also kind of why it stopped at some point for, for me and even my cousins. But so my songs are a little bit different. Both of them aren't quite from my childhood. One is, and it's more of, you can call it a chant, but it's more of a, something soothing to say. So a lot of times my grandma or my mom would say it to us if we got hurt, you know, you fall down, get a cut. Oh, that's so cute. And you start crying. And uh, they say this, this little rhyme, and it goes like this. Sana, sana, colita de rana. Si no sanas hoy, sanaras mañana. And all it means is heal, heal, little frog's tail. If you don't heal today, you will heal tomorrow. And I know, little frogs don't have tails. <laughs> this is where we get into the Spanish and the weird stuff. But I'm thinking it's a little baby frog. <laughs> a little thinking. baby frog. So and they ha- got, a tadpole. So some information gets a little lost in the translation. <laughs> yes. <laughs> I remember when I grew up and I found out that it was a little frog that they were telling us about. I was like, what? This whole time? <laughs> this whole time was a frog. <laughs> But that's always a, a nice thing to hear whenever you get hurt or you're just not feeling well. Aww. So building relationships, I think that's a good one. Uh, another one is one that I actually sang with my students at my school. As I said, I have a very large bilingual population. And I had students from all, I felt like mostly Mexico, but there was some from South America in different areas of South America. So there was different types of Spanish within my classroom. But I did notice that this song, a lot of my students knew, and I felt like the majority of them were from Mexico. But online, it said it was Puerto Rico, and another person said it was from Ecuador. So I'm actually not quite sure, but it worked with my students, and they really enjoyed singing it. And it's Los Pollitos, and it goes like this. Los pollitos dicen, pio, 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 cuando tienen hambre, cuando tienen frío. La gallina busca el maíz y el trigo, les da la comida y les presta abrigo. Bajo de sus alas, acurrucaditos, Duermen los pollitos, 
hasta el otro día. And what it is, it means the little chicks say pio, pio, pio when they are hungry and when they are cold. The mother hen looks for corn and wheat and she gives them food and grants them shelter. And under mama's wings, huddling up, sleep the little chickens until the next day. So is the, the pio, 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 is that like what? what it's equivalent. I, I would hear is like, like chirp, chirp, chirp. Yeah, it's equivalent to our chirp, chirp I always chirp. think that's neat how in other languages, animal sounds are expressed are differently. Different, yeah. yeah. And that's really cool. All right, Candice, it's your turn. Okay. So a couple songs that I was thinking about from my background. So I, I'm native Texan, but on my maternal side, my grandparents, uh, parents, <laughs> spoke fluent German at home. But like you, that hasn't really passed down, except in like little phrases. I grew up with hearing, uh, come in sie hier bitte, uh, whenever I was being called downstairs, which means come here please, and different phrases. And some musical things have been passed along too. So uh, one of them is a German song called My Hat, It Has Three Corners. And I'll include uh, some links I found to some information about these songs to the side of our podcast. So, in German, it goes, Mein Hut der hat drei Ecken, drei Ecken hat mein Hut, und hat er nicht drei Ecken, so wer es nicht mein Hut. And so a translation, um, which is pretty pretty true to the words, is, my hat, it has three corners. Three corners has my hat. This hat has not three corners. So this is not my hat. And there's a couple variations I've found. You'll see in the links that there's some different versions. But that's how I heard it growing up. And um, I've seen a lot of music teachers use this song in their classrooms with movement and even turning it into a little game where you take out one word and the students either hum it or audiate the word and uh, it can it can be really fun so i remember hearing my mom sing sing that song uh, when i was growing up and then another song that it's a little it's been a little hard for me to find the exact origins of the song it was it was first recorded for the uh, Library of Congress in the 1940s, but it seems to be originally a fiddle tune that may have come from Poland originally, uh, is what I'm I'm seeing whenever I look for its origin, and uh, came over and has just been become part of North American folk songs as well, but it's actually my first musical memory. Uh, when I was growing up, I remember my mom playing this on guitar and me trying in my own little wobbly way to dance to it. <laughs> <laughs> so it's called Put Your Little Foot. Uh, again, there's a couple of different variations to it. but uh, And in fact, there's another verse that I hadn't come across or heard before whenever I was looking at things. But the way I heard it growing up was... Put your little foot, put your little foot, put your little foot right down. Put your little foot, put your little foot, put your little foot right down. And you step to the left, and you step to the right, and you step to the left, and you step to the right. But again, if you've heard this song before, you have likely heard... Um, a different variation possibly. Yeah, for sure. I know as a music teacher, I was always looking for new songs to use or to introduce to my students. I hope the songs we'll show you throughout this series will help you in your classroom or perhaps therapy session. Absolutely. In the next podcast for this series, we will discuss music from the Latinx culture. Thanks for listening to Tuneful Talk. Y'all have a great day. Resources gathered for this podcast can be found on our website. If you have any questions about what we discussed or a topic request for a future podcast, please send us a message through our website, tunefultalk.weebly.com.